In this lesson, your old Uncle Frank is going to teach you how to do the calculations for chi-square using Excel. But before we do that, I want to make sure that you have a way of remembering how to say chi-square. This is a symbol chi is spelled C-H-I. Now I know some of you want to call it chi, some like chi, like a chia pet or some other way, but chi is the way it should be pronounced. So I'm trying to think of a way of getting you to remember that. Remember when we were talking about correlations, we talked about rho. Rho looked like a fancy P, but it was actually the Greek letter R and spelled R-H-O and pronounced rho. Well, if we put these two symbols together, we'll get Cairo, and it's pronounced like the city in Egypt, Cairo. So it's also spelled C-H-I-R-H-O. And it turns out these two symbols together have some historical significance. It's actually a monogram called the uh, Christogram, and it's a sim symbol of Christianity. So you'll see this chi with the letter rho in a number of different places having to do with Christianity. Uh, you'll see them on old Bibles, like here's from the book of Kells, which is about 600 A.D. So this is medieval times. Now here you'll see a big uh, chi, and underneath the right side of the chi, you'll see this little rho, this looking thing. It's got a head at the end of it, which is pretty interesting. But you'll see this kind of on, on uh, some Bibles, on the cover of some Bibles. This was a page in the book of Cal's. Uh, let's go a little uh, less far away in history. Not much. Just to 700 AD. So again, this is medieval times. Here's a Cairo. This is in the Lindisfarne Gospel. And here you see a chi, and here the row is a little bit more clear. Uh, let's take another look at. Uh, here's an amulet. An amulet's like something uh, on a necklace, and people would wear this during medieval times to uh, infer their Christianity. Also, here's one on a shield, and I'm sure that some of these were carried into the Crusades, which was much later, uh, what, 13, 1400 uh, A.D. So anyway, this Cairo, the only reason I'm emphasizing this is I really want you to know how to pronounce Chi square. Now, let's use our Chi square now that we know how to pronounce it. Here's a question I saw in a recent research article that a student sent me. It said, is there a relationship between whether a patient is warmed before surgery and whether that patient develops wound infection. So we have a two by two table here. We have two rows and two columns of data. Our, whether or not the patient was warmed, there were 141 total patients that were warmed. Six of those developed an infection. 135 of them did not. There were a total of 140 patients who were not warmed. 20 developed an infection, and the 120 did not. We could look at this a different way. There were a total of 26 patients that had uh, developed infections. Six of those were warmed, but 20 of them were from the non-warm group. Or we could say that there were 255 people who were wound-free, or infection-free, wound infection-free. Of those 255 that were infection-free, 135 of them were from the warm group, and 120 of them were from the non-warm group. Do you see any relationship there? Does it look like warming a patient helps, or doesn't help? I mean, maybe just by coincidence. Let's take a look and see how we would use our chi-square values. Well, there happens to be a program in you're on this desk and also on the web called chi-square.xls. Now this is just a Excel worksheet that I developed. 
the first page of it looks pretty scary. And it says instructions on the first tab. If we look at the bottom, you'll see that it says instructions, example, 2x2, two 2x3, by 2x4. Two, two by two by this is the size of the table. Well, we have a 2x2 two two table. There was yes, no, yes, no for each category. So that's a 2x2 two two table. So we'll click on the 2x2 two two tab to go to that page. And when we click on the 2x2 two two tab, we get a page that looks like this. And what I want to do is we'll zoom in on that top part. Uh, so let's zoom in on the top part. There, that'll make it a little easier to see. And we enter our data in the yellow areas above the... Do you see the orange cells that say A, B, C, D with white letters? We're going to put our data in the yellow cells above those. So in C4, we'll put our yes, yes data. In uh, D4, we'll put our yes, infected, but no, not warm data. So we'll enter our data in those four cells. Now once we do that, and we put in our 120, our last number, and we must press enter so that we're really entered it in that cell, then not only will we have these four numbers, but they'll total up for the columns and the rows. Not only will we get totals, but we'll get percentages. We'll see that a little over 50% of the patients were warmed, and a little less than 50% of the patients were not warmed. We'll see that of all the patients, 9.25% of them developed an infection, and 90.75% did not develop an infection. Also, when we entered in our 6 or 20 or 135 and our 120 in those yellow cells, they were also automatically entered into the observed cells down below. Here we have A, B, C, D, and we have the observed cells, 6, 20, 135, and 20, and 120. Now next to that is the expected number of cases we would expect in each cell. If there is no relationship between uh, wound infection and whether or not the patient is heated. So we would expect in cell A, which is the yes, yes category, while we saw six patients who were warm develop infection, if there was no relationship between infection and warmth, body warmth, we would have expected 13. In cell B, we saw 20 people in the non warm group developed infection. If there was no relationship between body warmth and infection, we would have expected to have only seen about 13. So maybe there's something going on here. 